Hi, this is Vaughan at West Goat Bell Pottery in Canada, uh, Nova Scotia, westgoatbellpottery.ca. Um, if you uh, are interested in making dinner sets, multiple pieces um, with an image, this is the video for you. I just took a commission to do uh, 12 plates and 12 side plates um, on a white background with black dogs running around the rim, uh, Labradors and uh, black labs basically. Uh, so this is how I'm gonna do it. So I'm gonna throw a little, I've already thrown all the pieces, but I'm gonna show you how to throw this little plate now. And the big plate is just made with more clay. So let's see if we can get down here. There we go. I have a bat system, which is a disc with a hole cut in it. And um, I actually have all these round discs that fit inside that hole. Um, and I found these for practically free for a dollar a piece at a recycling center where somebody was getting rid of all these discs. I've shown them in previous videos. Um, so they fit right inside there. Isn't that nice? Um, so keep your eyes open. I guess they were circles cut out of some countertop uh, for a, a sink of some sort, is my guess. Anyway, but they work great. Um, and I have one and a half pound balls of clay here. And so because they're still cubed, I'm basically rounding off the bottom like that and then banging it down so that it's moist surface um, and the clay will stick to that, no water on there other than just feeling a little damp. And then because I know if you're a beginner you need to round off your balls of clay because trying to throw a cube into a round ball is definitely tough. So just kind of pat it down a little bit before you start, and the best way to do it is to bang it into a ball first, but I'm strong enough, I don't need to do that. Um, this is a Shimpo Whisper wheel, which is nice because it doesn't make a noise while I'm throwing. First thing you do is you lock your body against the ball of clay, legs are wrapped around the wheel, your head is right over the top of the ball, and you center the ball of clay. I've got beginner videos on doing this, so you can look back. Actually, I might even link you one to one of them. But, um, but basically just center the ball of clay. Centering is the key for all thrown pottery. Of course you might want to throw things off center. Anything goes these days. Anyway, it's nice to be able to center clay. Once you can control that little ball of clay and make it not wobble, Oh, there's a lot of potential. Then you sort of squash it down like a pancake. As soon as it feels like it's catching your hand, release and get some more water. Squash it down again, it's starting to tack a little bit. Release, never release fast, just release steady. And squash down, take a look. Make sure you've got your level not too thin and not too thick. I'm going to open it up. I've got a lump in the center there, so I'm going to push that out into the outer area a little bit. And then use your black or blue rubber rib. And simply using the flattest curved edge, but it's the curved side, but the flatter edge, if, it's, if you've got one of these kidney ribs. And then just level the bottom of the plate with some compression. Let go slowly. Dribble a little water right at the edge there and throw a little wall, like if you were throwing a very wide coffee mug. About two inches high. I've kind of found that rims of plates are nice if they're about two inches high. Fingers pushing right at the edge at the bottom and then pull a lick again. And we get that nice, even, two inch high rim. Compress the rim with your finger. And using the wooden tool, little pointy edge here, make a little thing for the wire to go underneath. And then using the other end of the, and I've modified my rib so it, it does a nice one of these. And you push down and then pull the wall of the plate against the rib so it drags the water off. 
and you've got a groove there that's an undercut that'll be under the rim so you can put picture wire around it to hang the piece on the wall if that was necessary. Take all the water off. And this is a porcelain style clay B-Mix 5 so you don't have to worry about the rim having grit in there. And then using your middle finger, this hand's doing nothing, just steadying my other hand. But my middle finger is just like a chopper, chopping down that rim, moving backwards and forwards as it rotates. The wheel is slowed down a little bit from when I threw the plate. Now you can put your finger underneath to, to just kind of test for a feel to kind of see whether you think it's going to collapse. Take it as low as you can. Now I've also found that you don't want a sharp corner at that point there, so I always go back in and gently let's get that smooth a little bit there, a little bit of moisture. I like to have a gentle corner to the plate rather than a sharp corner because I'm going to use slip on these pieces and if you end up with a corner there you'll end up with a circular crack looking line which isn't a crack but it's the actual slip separating a little bit from the base of the plate to the rim. It took me a long time to figure that out. I used to trim out the whole centers of every plate just to hide that little because it wasn't the clay it was the slip on the surface that was doing that. You just take that off. And there's a plate. It's about, it'll end up at a seven and a half inch to an eight inch plate. Uh, it's a little bigger than that now, obviously, without the shrinkage. Uh, I need 12 of these, and then I'm gonna use a two and a half pound ball of clay to get a 10 and a half, 11 inch plate. Um, and these are one and a half pounds. There you go. Okay, the following morning, um, it's raining overnight, so basically things don't dry out too much, but I put them in my damp cupboard anyway, and the following morning, the plates are movable still on the rim, but they've risen up quite a bit. Uh, and when you throw plates, you don't want to lower the rim totally flat when the clay is really soft because they'll just collapse. So then I just put them on the wheel. Let's get you as close as you can see here. And then I simply place a finger underneath lightly and the finger on top firmly and lower the rim now that it's substantial enough in its strength to actually hold being very flat. My finger's catching on the little things on the giffing grip and then I just kind of compress the rim a little bit with my fingers there, making sure it's definitely sort of, you know, you could go as flat as you dare because it will rise up again. Then I have a little tub of black slip, but I also mix a little bit of LUG1, which is black un underglaze, I think by Spectrum. Um, I mix 25% underglaze into 75% black slip, which is, the stain, which is stained with Mason 6600 black stain. Uh, and it's just in a simple recipe of 40 ball clay, 20 uh, EPK, 20 silica, 10% Frit 3110 and 10% potash felspar. And that's my basic slip recipe. And then all I do is, if you can see this without my arm getting in the way, is I take the slip, oops, sure it's not too close to the back the wheel, and then just put a layer on because I want to have a set of black labs on this piece, so the, the color's got to be black. Now, even slip, if it's applied thick, will collapse this rim. So I do a thinnish coat three times. There you go. And so that gives me a black rim, which has got, if I just stenciled on top of that, you'd see lots of horizontal brush lines in the actual dogs. To recap, Put your bat on top and simply flatten the rim as much as you dare. Take your black slip and do a coating. 
and this will have to be done with just trial and error for you because your plate, I have no idea how soft it will be when you do this or how firm it is, but you just have to kind of take chances, I guess. I mean, I've learned through experience, so I know my clay body really well, and that's the key, knowing your materials. But, um, but anyway, that's the, I've got to do this to the four plates I'm doing today, but I'll have to coat them three times as they dry. And then each time they dry, I will test them to see how soft the clay is before I do it again. Uh, otherwise you could collapse the rim. Okay, the next step is I've got black brushed on the rim three times and they're now movable and yet the black is actually gone matte. It's not shiny anymore. So I am dipping pieces of paper in the shape of dogs, because this is a dog piece, um, and I place them on the surface and you can't move them once you put them down, otherwise you will smear the black that's underneath there. And these are just cut out of newsprint, and this was a telephone book actually, but uh, any kind of very porous paper would work. And that funny noise you can hear, this is what we call seagull time of the year, baby seagull. And um, the mother is trying to not feed her baby by the sound of it. But, uh, but anyway, I'm sticking these pieces of paper by dipping them in water, shake the drips off, and place them down on the surface. The water is just there to soften the paper a little bit and make it stick. And so I spent about an hour and a half yesterday cutting paper stencils. My wife uses scissors to cut her paper um, and I use either an X-Acto knife if it's a very detailed piece or a scroll saw. And my subscribers have told me that I ought to be using a cry cut machine, but I just like to use this scroll saw. It's a, I'm not sure what you, I think I call it a scroll saw. It just goes up and down. It's got a 360 degree blade in it. And I can actually cut paper with it. If I sandwich the paper between some stiff pieces of cardboard. That one moved a little bit, so you gotta be very gentle. That's why the surface has to be matte, because it actually sucks the piece in a little bit as you put it down. And then there's a tiny little gap there, so I usually end up with a few very small pieces of paper that I try to cut to fill in little spaces, because I don't, I don't want to leave any gaps, because it'll be hard to find these pieces of paper later on. And then without adding water to the surface, so I started with this one, so I always start brushing in, and you brush from the inside of the stencil to the outside. You don't want to brush towards the center or as you can lift the stencil. And you're doing this with a little pressure, but not too much. My finger is directly opposite underneath the plate. The plate. And you basically almost feel like you're squeegeeing any air underneath the piece out. So we go center to outside edge. And if you see any air bubbles, you have to keep brushing until you get rid of them because they will show up. And it's very easy if you put too much pressure on to move the paper. So you just have to judge if you try this, how you're doing it. Because the time you move it, you just, that's the, you know, it, it smudges the clay and you can't pretty much have to start again. Okay, so then I, there's a pile of water here in the bottom. So where the stencil is dribbled down. So I try to take that and get it out of there. It will soak into the clay. I try to make sure I can lift some of it if I can. And those are the stencils all applied. And now it will have to be 
like I said, many different ways of applying a background color, but I'm going to airbrush this and spray it. Uh, it's just white clay, basically, um, to, and I will spray it three times to get a good coat. Okay, I thought I might just, um, <clears throat> because studio practice, um, timetabling and everything is very important when you're doing uh, stencil work, where you're doing layers of colored clay, because it takes forever to a layer to dry, for a layer to dry. And I've been waiting probably about two and a half, three hours for that last layer to dry because it's humid today. Um, so I do have the first coat of white on um, and I'm just waiting. So you have to keep busy in the studio. So I threw a bunch of these earlier in the last week and I've had them covered in plastic. Um, and I just drew some whales on this one. Um, so what I'm gonna do is carve this piece. Um, and I'm just gonna use this one tool. I've drawn it out with a little pin tool and I'm gonna use this little FP9 tool from Diamond Core Tools. Uh, I've done five of these already today. It's been um, a lot of waiting today. So I'm gonna carve another one now and uh, it's almost closing time. So um, so basically uh, uh, I could get this one done and um, it, you know, basically have a nice uh, little grouping of work that I've done while waiting for the others. So using a pin tool, um, any old uh, nail or you know sewing needle or anything you want you just basically this is basically a layer of black clay on top of white clay it's a bmx5 um sort of uh clay body which is very smooth white clay that fires cone five and i actually with these pieces i fire it to cone four um because my slip recipe only goes to cone, cone four but basically just kind of scraffito through the black. This is like the surface of the water here. And um, this is the tool that has like a curve on one side and a flat on the other. So you can angle it and up and down and you'll get smooth, uh, sorry, thin or wide marks. So I think it's a really useful tool. So what I'll do is I'll just put this on stop motion so you can see the thing carved without actually having to spend the next hour looking at it. <laughs> So there you go, that's what I do while I'm waiting. So you, you need to have a flow in your studios because you know, idle hands, whatever. And if your time is money kind of thing or all the rest of it, you need to keep busy in the studio. So I like to have a bunch of these just made and I can, you know, anytime I find myself at a lost end waiting for stuff to dry, or whatever, I can just take one of these out and start carving it. And I've actually, this process with the stencil work takes a lot of time to wait between layers, especially since it's quite humid today. It has been all week. Um, so my kiln wouldn't even dry, but there you go. That's a nice little whale mug. Okay, now stencil removing the pieces has got to be done when the clay is no longer soft. So if you touch it, you don't take slip off with your finger. Um, and it shouldn't be dry because it'll leave rough edges. So at that point where you can touch it and it doesn't take any slip off on your finger, very carefully take an X-Acto blade or something similarly sharp. A, need, a sewing needle or something and you take them out so this has had three layers of white slip applied over the surface and this 
is just a simple black and white piece, but there are so many variations you could do on this by applying your slip top coat with different ways of doing it. Like I just airbrush these, but you can actually brush it on if you want to show brush strokes, you know, do a sort of painterly brush effect with uh, a fan brush or something. You could use sponges to apply slip, uh, especially textural sponges. Um, and you could even start printing on the, uh, on the background color by putting pigment onto a sponge by painting it on or stamping it on, whatever, putting it onto a sponge and simply pressing the sponge down so it gives you a, a printed painterly effect using a sponge. Be creative is the key. I'm sure my wife would go into that a lot more because she does that all the time. But you've got to be careful not to drop these back down, but that's why I do this when the slip no longer sticks to my finger, because if I dropped a piece of paper on the surface, it wouldn't stick. And you're simply lifting it up with your finger holding it a paper against the blade, which is why I like to do it just using an X-Acto blade. But be very careful not to lose these in your studio, because if you lose that little thing and it gets in your clay, you're going to be going to the emergency room. If it's, you know, you imagine you could get it, lose it in a piece of clay, you're going to throw on the wheel. So in 40 years of doing this, I've never lost a blade because I'm very careful. Okay, there's your stencil. Now I will actually trim out the center uh, when it's leather hard. So I get a pure white natural clay center to these. And the difference between the center of the color of the clay and the slip is very little, but there is a difference. I mean, the B-Mix clay is a slightly creamier version of the slip. So they're not pure white. It's more of a cream, uh, but that warms them up a little bit too. But that's how to stencil remove and look, Perfect stenciling, no bleeding, nice, nice stenciling. Okay, uh, the plates are now very dry, leather hard. The rim is even getting a bit dry, uh, so past leather hard on the rim. Um, and so I'm gonna flip them upside down onto my wheel and do the trimming. Yep, we have power. Uh, I have my little undercut on the rim here, so my tool can go underneath that little lip and then back over just to round it off. And that undercut is so people can hang pieces on the wall without seeing picture, uh, picture wire how they hang. Um, another way that I trim is using my metal kidney ribs like this. And this is a great trimming tool. Watch what in here, you just do it like that and it scrapes the surface off without leaving trimming lines, like little rings of metal. When you do the surface, it's totally smooth. I still like it even smoother than that for dinnerware because people serve these plates on a tablecloth or even onto a bare wood surface. Uh, so you don't want to scratch their wooden table, which might be a Chippendale. So I use the pebble to burnish the bottom of my plates. And then the edge, using the same rib, I've loosened it, so I've got to be careful. Um, I just use the metal rib to kind of go over the surface in case I left any fingerprints on when I was working. Because I'm using black slip, remember, and it's quite possible I lifted these up when I had some dirt on my fingers, so I always just slightly skim over with that. Turn it the right way up. Make sure there's nothing left dirt on the pads. And this is a Giffen grip. Bailey has a version of these as well, which I don't know, I've never used one. And then by using the same metal rib, I just lightly go over the slip that's over the edge. You could paint the edge black if you wanted to. I have done that in the past. But somebody told me that having black edges, I think, is what people do for funeral homes. So I thought, I don't want to make people think of funerals. Anyway, it gives you a nice clean white edge back to the natural clay. And then in the center, 
because these are, this is not sprayed heavily in the center and I don't spray the centers of my pieces in of plates because it makes the center of the plate really wet again and then the edge dries before the center of the plate so I, I don't tend to spray the center of the plate. But I will trim it out because there is overspray on the center. This is a Kemper trimming tool. It's just knocking a very thin surface off. And then I'm going to use the corner of the rib just to kind of, the trimming tool, just to really sharpen up that edge there. And then take a look at it. It's got some little rings in there from the trimming tool. If that upsets you, you can simply go in. I have one of these tools, these ribs sharpened so that it gives me a flat surface. I can hold it so you can see. So it'll get rid of the actual trimming marks from that Kemper tool. And then below it, take a look. Everything looks very clean in there now. Then you lift it out. And then all the debris, you just make sure there's nothing left sharp on there or, you know, little boogers. And there you've got a nice stencil, clean edge, two color. Uh, of course, this could be blue slip, black slip with blue background or green background, but I just did white again. This is for a lady in Manhattan, in New York City, who was on holiday here. She wants 24 plates, 12 large and 12 small. That's it. And this is Rose Russo, who I just had stopped by the studio, uh, who was driving through La Have, uh, one of the subscribers on the channel. Um, and just wanted to give a shout out to Rose, who was also a potter in Nova Scotia. Um, and I think it's Rose Russo on Facebook. I think she has some pictures of her work. Uh, but it was fun to see you, Rose. So, um, you know, stop by next time when you're coming through La Have. All right. Here's a couple of pieces of Rose's work.